Territory Treaty traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, home of the Siksika, the Kainai, the Hikani, the Stony Dakota, and the Sutina. So welcome to our community conversation, Basic Income Through the Lens of Food Insecurity. Uh, this event is hosted by both Vibrant Communities Calgary and Basic Income. My name is Lee Stevens, and uh, I work with Vibrant Communities, and we are the stewards of the Enough for All Poverty Reduction Strategy in Calgary. And I'm Angela Torre, I'm a member with Basic Income Calgary. Uh, we can go to the slide for social media. Um, feel free to follow us, Basic Income and Vibrant Communities Calgary, on social media. For registered social workers, you can actually um, apply for Category A credits for attending this event. Um, please see Yvonne and Joan for more questions about that. Um, but basically, when you're, when you're online, you simply fill out this event and you get Category A credits. Um, there are a number of municipal candidates in the audience. If you guys can just wave, we thank you for coming. Whoa. So I'll quickly touch on a few housekeeping items. Um, there isn't a scheduled break tonight, so feel free if you need to use the washroom, grab some food, some drinks, just go ahead and do so. Uh, in case of an emergency, we have two emergency exits, one on my left and the one most of you came in through tonight. And uh, if we need to, the muster point will be on, in the field on the north side of the building. Portions of the event will be videotaped and photographed, just so everyone's aware of that. And I'll just quickly touch on tonight's agenda. So tonight we have a fantastic keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Lynn McIntyre. After her... Thank you. Um, following her speak, uh, her, her talk, uh, we will have a panel discussion, and at that point we'll have opportunity for questions from the audience. And those post-it notes that you got at the beginning, um, please write down any questions that you may have, and we'll be collecting those to help with the panel discussion. Okay, so make sure you record your questions on those sticky notes. And finally, a reminder, um, when you first came in, I think you were encouraged to grab uh, the evaluation form. Please uh, take the time to fill that out. As well, I believe most of you were encouraged to grab how you can help or take away document. Again, I would encourage you to grab this, take extras if you want, and please read through this. This does outline what Basic Income Calgary is all about. We believe and support the concept of our principle-based Basic Income Guarantee Program here in uh, Alberta. And we're going to just play a short clip, which will outline uh, basically what we believe and support in. There's no audio, but really it's just music, so we'll just, we'll just appreciate in silence. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'm going to introduce Dr. Lynn McIntyre. Uh, she's a professor emerita of Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary. She's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada in Public Health and Preventative Medicine, as well as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Having retired from her active faculty position in November of 2015, Dr. McIntyre currently works on ways to reduce household food insecurity and insufficient access to food due to financial constraint. Please welcome Dr. McIntyre. Well, thank you.
very much for this invitation, and I'm just delighted at this very busy time of year to see uh, such a large audience. Um, so, you'll, you'll see a little bit of calisthenics every time I want to change the slide. What I want to do today um, is to um, explain what household food insecurity is and why it's important. Then I want to show um, that household food insecurity is about income, not about food. And then talk about what we know so far, um, how basic income or stimulation to basic income uh, might reduce uh, household food insecurity. It's kind of an inspiration for the rest of the uh, evening and with our panel and afterwards. So I only have time for a very brief social history of um, food insecurity in Canada. And for those of you that are, um, are millennials, you might have thought that hunger and food banks were actually part of all of Canada. But that basically is something that re-arose uh, in the 1980s after a period of um, post-war prosperity. We saw the emergence of, emer of food banks and also of children's feeding programs leading to report in 1989. 1989 as well, when Ed Broadbent got the House of Commons to unanimously uh, vote that Canada would eliminate child poverty by the year 2000. We didn't, but that was the beginning of the campaign 2000. Hunger counts came out of the food banks in March of every year across Canada, a network uh, producing their numbers and showing that, uh, uh, that group of uh, very unfortunate uh, users. Early on, we had child poverty initiatives, and I think we learned quickly that child poverty is part of family poverty, and we've moved now on to more of a poverty reduction, uh, broader strategy. Food insecurity surveillance, that is the regular measurement of food insecurity, actually began in 2004, regularized in 2005 in Canada, and we use the same measurement that the United States does, and I'll talk about it. That actually led to some very rich research in the problem of household food insecurity. Throughout this period um, of time, we've actually had the public very much aware, but legislators as well. I've actually had an opportunity to look at 30 years of our Hansards um, in a variety of legislatures in Canada. And the legislators all know about um, hunger and food insecurity. So when I talk about the term household food insecurity, and as it was said in the introduction, it's really the lack of access to adequate food because of financial constraints. It is the operationalization of this metric, this surveillance tool that's used to um, measure those that are food insecure uh, from those that are food secure. If you know the term food security, that comes from the 1996 World Food Summit in which um, the countries of the world came together and talked about food security. That is an aspirational term, um, and it's very comprehensive. So Canada um, signed on the World Food Summit and produced reports about it, and it accepted uh, the definition of food security, where all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary requirements, um, and their food preferences, and their active and, and healthy life. So that aspirational term could make everyone food insecure in a moment. If you want to go and find GMO-free foods, you can't find them, you're food insecure, if we accept that. So it's very important to understand that food security is an aspirational concept that's very broad and comprehensive. It has our food system, it has our local foods, it has healthy foods. Food insecurity is not the flip side of uh, food security. It is that which is measured by this um, instrument that I'm going to be talking about, and it is that which is about having lack of access to food because of financial constraint. So the Household Food Security Survey Module is the national instrument that we use. So when we say somebody is food insecure, we're not making it up. And I think we should stop these little you know, interview questions like, what does food insecurity mean to you? No, this is what it means. It means that you were offered 18 questions on an instrument, and you answered affirmatively to at least one or two. And the questions go in, in gradation from worrying about running out of food to having to compromise on the quality of your food to having um, food deprivation associated with even um, skipping meals or not eating for a whole day. Food insecurity is measured at the household level. It's about the adults in the household, of which there are 10 questions, and the children in that household. 
um, and, of which there are eight questions, and you get um, the results from that. So that's what we're talking about. When I say household food insecurity, it's those measures. So what about the situation today? So I mentioned we have national surveillance, and that's through the Canadian Community Health Survey. So if you've heard the, um, the term 4 million, that's the original data, the number of counts of food insecure individuals who have answered at least um, one positive on that food insecurity scale is 4 million in the year 2012 when we had nationally representative data. The severity does vary. A marginally food insecure person is one that's worrying, or household is worrying about food and, and have some small compromises. The moderately food insecure household is actually changing the dietary composition of the diets and having to um, uh, change their, uh, their uh, dietary uh, intakes. And then the severe food insecure is our classical hunger group, which includes the real deprivations, including not eating a whole day. So you can see that 12.6% of uh, Canadian households in our last national survey, we're going to get new data uh, next year, um, were food insecure, and that we have the relationships of 4% marginal uh, all the way to 2.6% severe. These are very, very large numbers. Four million is a large number of people. If you consider some, some small food programs of 15 people you know, cooking together, you've got to talk about the scale of four million when you're talking about dealing with this problem. So it's a problem of material deprivation. I just want to show you a few um, um, sort of um, stratifications by here's household composition. So the big winners <laughs> are the low-income loan mothers. Um, living alone with their children. So they're representing 34% um, of, of all those um, households have got, are living in food insecurity. You can see that families with children are also more food insecure than the couples without children or even the couples with older children. And then I'm going to be talking about this interesting group of the single unattached um, elderly, which is actually almost the, among the lowest of the food insecure. You can also see a worrisome group of these single unattached employables um, that are also um, more likely to be food insecure. So that's the range. It varies across the provincial jurisdictions and territories, and that's really important because that means that food insecurity is policy sensitive. There are different uh, policies for housing, for wages, uh, for, um, in, for income supports, etc., across the country, and that results in different levels of food insecurity. So we have the tragedy of uh, Nunavut, where 45% of households in Nunavut are food insecure, and the territories are high. But you also see that in the year 2012, Alberta was distinguished by having actually among the lowest, uh, or if not the lowest, food insecurity rate uh, in the country at 11.5%. The numbers are, however, um, different in terms of the density of population. So it's important, while we have very, very, very high rates in the territories, 84% of all the food insecure households in Canada live in Alberta, Quebec, British Columbia, and Alberta. People are very, very concerned, as they should be, about children living in households that are food insecure. And here we see, again, a, a startling and appalling uh, result of 62% of children in Nunavut are living in food insecure households. And here we're not doing that well in Alberta. We lost our advantage in terms of having overall lower rates of food insecurity our child poverty is higher, and therefore our, we have 17% of our children living um, in food insecure households. And I'm going to be pointing out this pretty low rate um, of child poverty in Newfoundland Labrador, which should surprise you. So why is this important? It's important because there are impacts on health, uh, mental and physical health, and life stress throughout the life cycle that food insecurity um, uh, brings to uh, those that experience it. So I'm going to just highlight a few um, of my work and, and um, some of others as well that um, takes you a little bit through this a glimpse of what this looks like. I think the important underlying factor is that the impacts of food insecurity on health and mental health are not mediated um, nutritionally as much as they're mediated by the stress of living in that experience. And feeding up a child that lives in a, ch in a household that's food insecure uh, is not actually um, going to improve their health or mental health uh, as much as removing them from, um, uh, from the family's um, experience of being food insecure. 
So what is interesting but awful about food insecurity in the world of knowing about the adverse childhood experiences and other types of neglect is that food insecurity has its own unique and independent adverse effect, all else included. So in 1992, I was part of the design team of the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth. And if you've ever done a survey, they gave me one question. And the question that we could put in the survey that started in 1994 was, has your child ever experienced hunger because there's no food in the house or money to buy food? And then we follow these children for uh, between um, 10 and 16 years. And we had their food insecurity through child hunger experience, which is the most severe experience. And we had their health. We had their uh, mental health, their chronic diseases, and we had lots of information about the household's composition, education, and income. And this is what we found in this cohort of children. The children who ever experienced hunger had uh, poorer um, health than those that did not. All else taken into account. That if they had, uh, every two years when they came back, if they had another episode of, of answering yes, that, ch that they had lived again in, in hungry circumstances, they were able to not only have poor health, but to convert this into chronic conditions, including asthma. That when you looked at these young people 10 and 16 years later, um, in terms of their depression and their suicide ideation, it was significantly higher than those that had not had the experience of hunger. And the last study was looking at the youth uh, reporting on themselves. So this was not the mother reporting when they were a little kid a youth reporting and following those over time, that the youths who reported the experience of hunger not only were more likely to have depression, but a persistent depression. There's usually a, a natural um, history of reducing uh, depression in the older adolescent compared to the younger one, and these um, children didn't change at all um, over time. That's one of the hypotheses of what we call biological embedding, that something has very adversely affected these children's brains. In adults, we have a similar, very poor picture. So when you, if you only want to ask one thing to an adult, you ask them about how do they uh, report their own health, and if it's for, fair or poor, it's very likely to be so, as you will find the outcomes come later. So on this graph, you'll see adults in the Canadian Community Health Survey who are reporting um, food insecurity, and the orange is the food secure group, and then you can see marginal, moderate, and severe. And this is what we call a gradient which means that for the increased dose of the severity of the experience of food insecurity, you see increased adverse effects on health, mental health, and, and clearly life stress. So it's not just the severely food insecure that are having these health effects. It's a gradient. And this is a very, what we call a steep gradient. So much so that you're seeing, I think, up to 40% of those that experience severe food, food insecurity. Um, over, and they, these are one-year measure. Um, will we'll be telling you that they feel that their health is poor or fair. And this converts itself into chronic conditions in adults as well. So you see that we have a gradient, um, a reverse gradient for no chronic conditions for the food secure being the most likely. And the, the multiple morbidities, and you see the list of these things from diabetes to asthma, whatever, some are diet sensitive, others have nothing to do with diet, much more likely in a gradient effect to be um, chronic conditions from those with food insecurity um, experience. So j just a month or so ago, my student and I published this paper, uh, which is the gradient of uh, mental health problems among adults with, um, with food insecurity experience. And again, we see the sharp. So the lowest is, is the food secure, marginal, moderate, and severe. And here we're seeing up to, here we go, 40% of uh, individuals that are severely food insecure can report suicidal ideation in the past year, depressive thoughts in the past month, and a major depressive episode. Most of these were uh, physician diagnosed. Very, very profound mental health effects. Again, the message being that food insecurity is an experience of deprivation and material deprivation that has, um, that's mediating primarily through stress. And this costs a lot. So my colleague, Valerie Tarasek, with whom I've been working in the last uh, six years, was able to take the Canadian Community Health Survey food and security rates and match it with the um, uh, Ontario Health Insurance Plan records. And you can see, again, the gradient. The food secure for adults, 
um, and you've got a, over a two-fold increase in an annual expenditures for those um, with the higher levels of food insecurity, including that little marginal group. All they are is deeply worried about running out of food, and you see that they also incur increased costs. The other thing you see, um, if you spend lots of time on these data, is that the only thing that's not different is day surgery. Every other aspect of health care, from prescription use to emergencies to being hospitalized, um, are, it's not that these people are big users, right, of going to the family doc or, what, or to the walking clinic. But pervasively, there's an increase in the um, health care requirements of those that are uh, increasingly food insecure. So this obviously implies that food insecurity, if it were reduced, would yield a, sec a food security dividend that would be a dividend that would give us health and mental health and well-being and also save us a lot of money, which is why it's important and why we need to do something about it. So we come to the concept of income. So this is the type of um, curve you get in terms of the food insecurity rates being you know, highest with those with the lowest income and going down in this kind of curvilinear um, curve. So it's very important that even at the lowest income levels, we only have about 50% of the population that's food insecure. So not all the poor are food insecure, and not all the food insecure are deeply poor. But that's because income is only one aspect of material deprivation. What we also have to consider, which is why I think basic income becomes so interesting, is we have to, we have to consider the stability of the income and the income source. We have to consider, of course, the costs. Uh, and the expenditures that need to be uh, at play in terms of housing and other types of things that, go that your income is going to be used for. We have to consider your debt level, and we have to consider what kind of assets you have. That kind of mix is all what is really important in terms of the material deprivation um, that uh, will lead you to be food insecure. And all of those have different things to be picked away at if you're trying to um, have a basic income to reduce uh, food insecurity. So, let's talk about um, the difference between risk and, and uh, attributable risk. So here we see the kind of major source of income of the food insecure. Um, and so you can see that absolutely, social assistance, that's your ticket, <laughs> winning lottery ticket to food insecurity. And so in Canada, we have all, you know, about 70% of the households that are reliant upon social assistance, welfare, income supports, whatever the rhetoric is that will be food insecure. And then we see that our EI system a little bit less so, and we still see this uh, group of um, hardworking employed folks, and then at the bottom we have those that are relied on seniors' income. And let's unpack this. Okay, so here we see the proportion of the food insecure in Canada among the households that are food insecure per province, how many, what's the proportion of those households that are reliant on wages? Okay, this is your hard working citizen group, right? And you can see, it's not good to be winning all these competitions like Alberta here. So we have that 77%, 76.8% of Alberta households that are food insecure are reliant upon the wages that they're earning. That's your hardworking citizens. Whereas our friends in Ontario and, and Quebec is around 58, 59%. Those are very policy sensitive differences. You could say perhaps the manufacturing sectors are Ontario and Quebec, different types of um, service sectors and income supports, unionization may be making a difference in some locales and not in Alberta. Here's the other end of the spectrum. Here's our um, winning tickets and social assistance. So while we have, yes, we've got this high, high prevalence of our households that are food insecure being these wage earners, we also are making pretty well sure in this um, last national data that if you were on social assistance, you had almost the highest rates of food insecurity if you were on Alberta social assistance. And then we have our little friends in Newfoundland and Labrador. So Newfoundland and Labrador, what a curious place to have poverty reduction. So they actually did it, um, they did it in uh, 2007, over a five-year period. 
um, they were able to drop their food insecurity rates from 60% to 33%. That's about 50%. That magical 50%, what did they do? Income. They brought the income support rates up. They indexed their rates to inflation. They increased the earning exemptions. They increased low-income tax threshold. They increased the liquid asset. Like, 50% reduction of food insecurity in the highest risk for food insecurity population in Little Newfoundland, Labrador. Okay. What about the seniors? So we have this um, very interesting group. And again, for those that are not millennials, and many people in this room have never lived in um, Canada when um, old ladies had cat food in their, in their cupboards and no cats, right? And that was one of the shames of the poverty of our um, elders that was actually um, dramatically reduced and eradicated virtually by, uh, the, by the assistance given to them. So this is what it looks like. So Canada introduced um, the Guaranteed Income Supplement and the Old Age Security. And the red line is that about $16,850, that's how much it is. You can see that it's well above, for the single unattached person, the social assistance rates in the various provinces, but it's still below the blue line, which is your low income cutoff, your poverty line. So we're talking about a huge poverty reduction strategy that actually is still below the low income cutoff, but far above what are social assistance rates. Remembering again that Income stability and the reduction of income shocks and other things are actually really important in the whole story of food insecurity. So we were able to um, do this study which has been getting an awful lot of, um, of support. So one of the things that was used for was to uh, re partially, I think there was other people <laughs> saying the same thing, to reduce the, the age 67 to 65 um, change to the old age, um, uh, to the pension. So what we were able to show is, what does it look like when you're a single unattached uh, person in the near elderly age, between ages 55 and 64, and you've got a very low income? And what happens to you in your, in your food insecurity at that time after you get your birthday card and you're over the age of 65? So that's the study that we did using the Canadian Community Health Survey as a simulation of basic income. So the first thing you see is that there's a variety of income sources in all different colors for those that are under the age of 65. That some are working, some are social assistance. Everyone here has under, has under $20,000. After age 65, though, that green is the senior's benefits, the old age security guaranteed income supplement. That's the source of income that they are receiving, and that's so it's showing that that's what's probably making a change. And the food insecurity rate goes from 22% for that age group under age um, 65 to 11% after age 65, a 50% reduction of food insecurity. 22% to 11%, a 50% reduction. I actually say there's very few social policies that have 50% effect sizes. And income is one, and food insecurity is so sensitive uh, that it's really worth considering. So we were able to extend this and to look at some of the health effects, mental health and physical health, and my colleague was able to look at costs. Um, and so we were able to find very remarkably, and again, this is a simulation because this is not a longitudinal study, it's basically a series of, um, of cross sections, is that the health and mental health of those that are living in this near elderly, low income, unattached life is worse until age 74. So you actually are, you get 10 years of age, of aging, and should be health de 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 uh, depriving, you actually are, are healthier than you were at 64 for 10 more years just by getting the basic income and having you know, food insecurity. And then you see again the big, the big increases. You know that the, the red there on the right hand this side, um, is the food insecure health care costs for over 65. They start gobbling them up, right, because they're sick and they're poor and all the rest. Um, and so food security is very, very um, much a cost saving, especially in the older age group. 
There have been other studies um, looking at the simulation of basic income, and I'm going to finish up um, shortly. So we have um, a very nice study that showed that even our universal child benefit program for those under, uh, children under the age of six, those households, they ended up also showing food insecurity rate decreases. And that's actually a modest amount, but it's also a sort of a basic income. Another study um, was a one-time increase in British Columbia of um, the food insecurity, uh, of their uh, social assistance rates, and they immediately saw a food insecurity drop. And in fact, um, if you were around for the Ralph Bucks, when we got the, uh, the one time, that year, the, the March was right after, there's James laughing, that was the lowest rate of food bank use. We looked as if we had like solved the problem just because Ralph Klein sent us a 400 bucks basic income. And then I've done a couple of studies as my colleague has as well, following up families um, from the food insecure to the food secure state and showing what income does and uh, some employment effects. <coughs> so yet again, all right. We've never seen food insecurity rates drop with food-based programs. Uh, we can talk about that in um, the longer time. So I say I present these data to you, but then we have to look at what are we actually doing today. We have food-based solutions are dominating as a, a, in the food insecurity sort of um, discussions. We have the food banks um, being, again, blamed <laughs> for being there and blamed for whatever. We conflate. Conflation is a great word that we use in academia. It's a mixing of ideas. We conflate this food security, food insecurity stuff, this aspiration with these people that don't have enough money to buy food. And food waste is all in on this one. I actually don't support food waste, but I don't think you give food waste to the hungry and think that's a solution. And in looking at legislation over the last 30 years, we have had all this rhetoric of the, of the um, in the um, House of Commons and in various legislatures, and we basically had a couple of um, food donation and indemnification acts. If you donate tainted food to the food bank, you're not liable, and some tax credits for food donations. That's the entire legislative ambit in the name of food insecurity over 30 years. So, in conclusion, household food insecurity, I think I've shown you, is an important, it's costly, it's an income problem, not a food problem, and in fact, it's highly responsive to income receipt. It's going to be one of the outcomes of the basic income experiment. The extent of food insecurity, um, which is um, over 12.7% you know, now, um, is emblematic that we have social safety nets that are not working, um, and that the basic income solution is emerging now through the evidence. We're going to have more evidence with our pilots. And it's really time to, um, to use it, not only as an important health problem to be resolved, but also as an important metric to show uh, the benefits of basic income. Thank you very much. OK, sorry. <laughs> I forgot about this part. Oh, thank you so much. It matches perfectly. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everyone here from Virus Communities Calgary and Basic Income Calgary, thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you. I'm going to invite you. thought uh, to their answers, uh, but I really do want to thank all of you for taking the time to, to, uh, to really think about uh, basic income and, and uh, uh, how it relates to yourself, your organization, uh, the work, the advocacy that you do. And so uh, I'm going to start here with uh, Mary Salvani to my, my left, your right, I think. Uh, Mary is a member of the Disability Action Hall, and she's a vocal advocate for better solutions that address the root causes of poverty and lack of accessibility within our community. Mary stretches every dollar to make ends meet, and she is a dynamo. I've known Mary for about 10 years now, and, you know, powerful, powerful advocate. So, thank you, Mary, for, for joining us tonight. To Mary's left, 
is James McCara. Really, you are. Okay, sorry, sorry about that clear. James is the CEO of the Calgary Food Bank and co-chair of the inaugural Food Dignity Constellation or collaboration. James is a passionate. Uh, James is passionate about making Calgary an amazing place for, for people to live. For everyone. Uh, to James's left, we have Carol Carpo Lagazal. I've been practicing. <laughs> Uh, Carol is originally from France, and she works at the Women's Centre of Calgary. She started as a peer support and social issues uh, volunteer. Now, Carol has uh, recently earned her master's degree in social work, so congratulations, Carol. She's, uh, she's going to take those credits and run, and maybe there's extra for being on the panel. And so now, she is the social issues coordinator uh, with the Women's Centre. So please welcome our panelists. And of course, we, we brought her up for good measure. So, and so as I said, uh, we did send a few questions and uh, I invited all uh, of the panelists if they wanted to um, put any slides together or any notes, uh, we would make slides available. And uh, so, um, we'll uh, forward, uh, Mary has a slide. So, in Dr. McIntyre's uh, keynote address, she outlined that income, rather than food itself, is the solution to food insecurity. In your experience, what are the challenges or problems with current solutions to food insecurity and poverty? Well, you know, we've, we've actually been talking about this a, a lot, and, uh, you know, one of the things you, you talked about is, some of the things you have to go through to actually make, meet your basic needs. Oh yeah, um, for example, I just paid for school today. One of the things that I did was I applied for, I actually got my grades high enough so I could get a bursary and also sold some photos over the course of the summer so I don't have to use the age to pay for it. Um, what's, the, what's the age experience like for you? Hell and water. Uh, with H, um, when I first applied for H, I did a 16-hour test over the course of two days just to prove that I have a disability that doesn't grow legs and leap. Um, with H as well, when I first applied, I brought my mom with me, which was a great support, um, but the age worker thought I couldn't speak for myself, so she asked my mom, um, well, can Mary talk? Does Mary understand what Mary, what we're saying? And she asked that in front of me. And obviously, you're, you're excelling academically, so that answers that question. I'm going to move on to James. James, I'm going to ask you the same question. So again, uh, Dr. McIntyre outlined that income rather than food itself is the solution to food insecurity. And so what's been your experience with the challenges of our current solutions? You have to read these small notes on little things and then you have to hold them far enough away that you can actually see the pen and somebody knocks them out of your hand. So, in, in looking at this, one of the, the things that really caught me from Dr. McIntyre's presentation was that there is no system. And for the pieces that exist, to Mary's comment, you're constantly trying to prove something that is highly evident that you should not have to go back and prove and reprove just to say, you know, what is it? Has it got two legs and run away? No, I'm pretty much, you know, the way I am, or this is what we're working on. So when we look at the pieces that are in here, um, we look at food as a proxy, but we don't actually talk about the role that food is playing in the well-being and the universal health of people. Thanks, James. That was that was under three minutes. That's <laughs> all right, Carol. Over to you. Um, just want to go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, 
So I worked with the Women's Centre and we were a registered charity. Um, one of the main challenges I think for us um, that we see is that we're trying to meet an ever increasing need to the charitable model and it's just not working. Um, I think we're, we're doing a wonderful job. We, we, we partner with a certain number of organizations, with the food bank. Uh, we have many, many programs uh, around food insecurity, trying to uh, alleviate that. Um, uh, and that's our food day program. I have our numbers here with the food bank. Last year we had over 3,500 referrals, for instance. Uh, uh, so far this year we have over 1,700 referrals. Uh, so those are huge numbers. And I really do think many, many organizations do a wonderful job uh, on that. But it's just not enough. Uh, we can never catch up to this ever increasing growth. Um, and really, what we're doing, um, I feel we kind of, it's, it's band-aid solutions really, and they're not really solutions at all. Um, and we really need something more sustainable and more stable. All right. Thanks, Carol. Well, um, that leads into the next question, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, have you answer that one first. And that's, so why does the Women's Centre and, and yourself have such a keen interest in basic income? Um, um, one of the first things is that um, also we have several areas of work in our um, get assistance area, which is the area where we respond to immediate need um, um, women who come to the door have. Um, we work a lot on, around food. We have many, many food programs, so that's a huge bulk of our work. Um, so there's interest there, of course. Um, the second thing is, I kind of like the, the boat metaphor to explain structural factors, like the boat is sinking, we're trying to get water out, uh, but we also need to understand why is the boat sinking in the first place. And the first thing we see is that we're taking water out, but it's, we can never get the water faster enough, fast enough. Uh, then we, we, so that's, that's kind of something uh, that's not feasible for us to do. Uh, the second thing that we see, I think basic income uh, and food insecurity, when we talk about food insecurity, is a good example of those systemic factors, of those root causes uh, that we need to um, act on. Uh, I think that's really important for us, and also recognizing that um, um, uh, food insecurity and poverty, we talk about poverty as well, but it's, it's, it's a lack of income. I think it needs to be really uh, said clearly. It's about the lack of income. We can talk about um, uh, mental health issues, addiction issues, uh, lack of social capital, lack of human capital, sure, but those are all consequences of lack of income. And that's why it's important for us. Thank you. James, I'll pass the question over to you. Um, what, what's the interest that uh, the Public Food Bank has in basic income? None at all. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I don't think you're going to get away with that. Um, looking, and, and I'll use a, maybe 30 seconds of my previous unused time, <laughs> good luck with that one. Um, looking at the basic income, when you look at the statistics and the information over time, and it sounds kind of weird to talk about people's statistics because they're not, but when we want to look at what the trends are and what's going on, Ralph Bucks decreased food bank demand. It was that simple. When age was brought up to a reasonable rate, or an unreasonable, depending on how you look at it, food bank demand went down, and then crept up because age did not keep pace with the cost of living. So what we've seen is when we look at a, a balanced income, a basic income coming in, there is that element of stability for a portion of Calgarians. Now, as Lynn showed on her, sorry, Dr. McIntyre showed on her chart, Canada is one of the greatest places to be if you want to be food insecure. It's even better in Alberta because we rank high in both, you know, we're going to need food if we have a wage and we're going to need food if we're on some kind of income support. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, in that, I would defer to some kind of structural change that needs to shore up some of the places that we're falling behind. And, and it becomes very complicated very quickly, but we have to start somewhere and in some segment, it may not be everybody, but this is an excellent place to start when we're looking at those we're leaving behind. Thanks, James. So Mary, so you're part of the Disability Action Hall and you're also a really strong advocate 
What's your interest in basic income? Well, we always talk about the, at the hall that um, people don't have enough income to make ends meet, to do the things they want to do, and that sometimes they have to make sacrifices just to survive um, and thrive in society. I think that basic income is a right for everyone. I think that uh, everyone has the right to live the life they want to live, and that's why I believe in basic income. Thank you so much. So I'm going to bring Lynn in on this now. And so, um, so basic, basic Income Calvary is advocating for a principle-based basic income uh, in Alberta. And so those, uh, those principles are on that sheet. I should know them by heart. Be universal, be adequate, be individual, uh, be a part of a social support system, and be a step forward. So I've asked Lynn and the other panelists, um, why are these principles so important as we seek an income solution to food insecurity and poverty? And I'll, I'll start with Lynn. So the, uh, the principles really begin with a premise of, um, as Mary was saying, people have the right to live dignified lives and that we are not um, judging people, their, their deservedness, um, us or more. That, um, that that's what the issues of the universal is. That's what the issue of, um, of, of getting away from these very means-tested and mean-testing ways that we do assess people's eligibility. The notion of an individual as well, there have been many um, uh, very important studies of basic income done, particularly in our global south. And um, individuals there are women who have not been you know, thought of as persons or disabled persons, etc. When individuals are given basic income, their status changes, their power purchasing power changes, and their um, ability to be emancipated changes. So that's what the individual is about. You're not going to be judged by the clan that you keep. And it's a very important principle for that. The other principle and, um, that is we cannot overlook is that when we give basic income, we render invisible, I, I say, 50% of our food insecurity problem. The other 50% is there for our health professionals, social professionals, other types of service providers to actually do what they're trained to do, to take care of people with mental health problems and addictions, to take care of people that need um, capacity building, etc. as opposed to the time of these professionals now scrounging around for resources. So this is not a replacement of the entire social safety net of a just society. It is really around rendering invisible those whose problems are easily assuaged by having enough um, to meet their basic needs. So that really speaks to the complementary part of a, a sound social support structure. Carol. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, uh, we, we also have um, 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 some uh, basic income uh, policy that the Women's Center is. It's pretty much aligned uh, with the basic income group. We've been working together on this. Um, uh, about social supports, I would say um, we bring in a gender lens as always, and I think that it's really important to um, keep in mind that we've seen this already, but women, uh, especially um, um, uh, low income, low um, and families are particularly vulnerable in terms of uh, um, food insecurity. And I think it's really key to um, maintain uh, labor rights, uh, employment rights, and, and not, sometimes we have some concerns uh, uh, that this could be used as a way, almost as a subsidy for the private sector. I think it's really important, specifically on this principle, to keep that in mind. And in general, I think those principles are really key in ensuring um, um, an adequate implementation of actually having basic income. And also my hope, um, when I look at all the principles, uh, is also to kind of reframe poverty, the way we see poverty, the way we see food insecurity. What we see um, a lot at the Women's Center uh, linked to food insecurity um, is there's a lot of stigma still, there's a lot of shame uh, around it, and my hope really 
will be that this will, uh, those principles will contribute to changing that, to uh, shifting that. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. I'll pass it on to James. Wow. Um, what they said. <laughs> no. 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 When you're looking at a basic income and when you're looking at the principles that have been outlined here today, it's very easy to think that this will be the silver bullet. It, it's not. Um, there are pieces that we have to put in play and there are some very tough questions that we have to ask ourselves. If you phone the food bank tomorrow and say, I need some food, just on the limbs earlier slide with the blue line, the low income cutoff, there's only about 250,000 people in Calgary who could phone, phone the food bank tomorrow and, and get a hamper. That, that's not a lot, we, you know, we don't really think about that. But even if one person phones, no matter where they are on that scale and where they have a crisis, by underpinning their support and being able to move the resources to where they're required, not where the babysitting is required, is, is critical. The principals have to underpin a well-being that will allow others, as has been said, to do their job. So the police don't want to walk around to domestic violence situations knowing that really, for the sake of a few meals, a lot could be calmed down. It wouldn't get rid of the issue, but a lot would be calmed down in that household because the fight started because they were trying to decide who was going to eat tonight. That's the things that you get into that you don't consider. It's not about having no food in your fridge. It's about being able and being supported to address those things that are on your mind, be they mental health, be they other stressors. That it, the things that Lynn pointed out. So when we think about food and policy, by establishing a base from which people can actually operate and understanding how that base functions and what the benefits are, I think we will start to make radical changes in terms of how we look at our neighbors and what happens when you undergo a period of stress. Reminds me of uh, a saying that many of us um, say and hear a lot, which is, um, Poverty is all, always about income, but it's not all about income. And so, again, what I'm hearing is this reinforcement that basic income and income support is a complementary support uh, for people as they um, advance. Mary, so, so Mary and I had a really good conversation about a couple of particular uh, principles that you thought were important. Um, yeah, so if you want to speak to those, those principles. Well, we talked about being individual. Um, everyone has, we all, said, we all agree everyone has the right to eat, but not everyone likes the same food and not everyone needs the same food. So like, the income should reflect what we need as our, like, for our own selves. For example, um, I use a walker, so that costs money but a person who's blind doesn't have the same need as I do. Uh, you talked a little bit about adequacy. I mean, we've talked a little about that, about that already, but uh, anything else you wanted to add to that? I just think that it's really about choice, too, because one of the things I've learned is that people with low incomes don't get a lot of choice. They have to go almost beg for the things that they need be grateful for what they have, and sometimes the choices that they do have aren't very good. For example, in my building, we have the, we call it the food bank shelf. I feel very lucky that I have access to it, but not everyone in my building has access to it because of the fact that that is run by an agency that is only taking care of their clients in this building, and not everyone works with that agency. And then I look at the shelf and I'm like, what choice do I really have? The fatty uh, salad dressing that is moldy or the condensed milk, 32 cans of condensed milk that arrived this morning? We, we, were, uh, we were joking about what we could make with 32 cans of carbonation of condensed milk on the wall. Thanks, Mary. So, I think I'm going to make some sort of wall. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I see I, I see people doing this, so I'm going to promise at our next community conversation, popsicles for all. I don't care if it's minus 30 out, popsicles for all. So I appreciate you sticking in with a, with a, a 
very warm building. And I see Joan, uh, she has been sorting post-it notes like crazy over there. So she's gonna come over here and give me some. Um, yeah, because we still have a, a good amount of time to discuss some things. So we've got a couple of questions, and uh, so what I'll do is um, I'm going to read the question, and whoever would like to take a stab at answering it, just jump in. Don't all jump in all at the same time. I know what you for the like. I know, I know. They're never going to do this with me ever again. So yes, I do need new glasses. Okay, so here's the question, uh, and it's an interesting one. What would be the minimum basic income to drastically reduce food insecurity? And I'm gonna say we're talking Alberta. Um, I would, um, thanks for that question. I mean, I still think that that 16,850 that I was able to show um, worked successfully a few years ago would be a good crack at it. Um, we have some living wage information that's coming out of the various um, cities in, in um, Alberta, and we certainly have different living wages, um, very high in uh, Calgary in 1815, compared to other places like Red Deer or um, even Edmonton, and the north is higher still. So we're not really able to set, to see what that kind of level would do. Um, in terms of it, but I think you know we're I think we're talking around still under twenty thousand is what would be needed. The properties of a of a basic income is it's it's reliable, it's stable, it comes every month. Um, it allows you to do some buffering in terms of um, any kind of shocks that come up. So it's actually worth more than its dollar amount because of its stability. Okay. Anyone else want to take a shot at that question? Following up on that, I would say the, the, the fact that if there are no conditions, like it's universal, it's really important in, um, in offering a dignified solution. I think that's, that's really, really important. It's something sustainable. It's sustainable. I think it should be 72,000. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go. Well, let's let's go with the average wage in Canada. And if we say we have an average wage in Canada, or a family income is between sixty and seventy thousand dollars, then why don't we just cut to the chase and say, you know what? Let's give you a buffer in which you can live, and you don't have to sell your car. Your assets don't get stripped. You don't get ripped apart by predatory lenders. Uh, you don't have to decide what food you're not going to eat in order to you know get the, the running shoes for the kids in January. Um, I think when one of the, the frustrations that we see when we talk about means testing and, and putting some of these questions to it is who are the deserving for and who are we to actually contribute and say, okay, this line is good enough, but if you make a buck more, it's not. Why don't we just look at it and say, you know what, it's going to cost you $27,000 to live in Calgary. Let, let's start there. It may be only $24 in, in Edmonton, and I mean dollars as opposed to $27,000. Because growing up in Edmonton, we didn't need a lot. Um, <laughs> but I think to set arbitrary, we end up fighting the complexity of words and saying, well, this low income is that, and this person has done that. I think we have to start to say, you know what, let's, let's just say we're going to shoot for $27,000 in Calgary, and those are the things that are going to ensure that people don't fall behind, because the people who have that, everything is shown. You will help your neighbor before you help yourself. So I think that would actually go a lot further to saying, okay, what is truly needed is a neighborhood and that stability. So I think discussing the total price, um, let's actually move past that and move into the actual what we want the impact to be, regardless of what the price is. And that uh, you know, certainly uh, speaks to the complexity of what is adequate. And uh, it's one of the reasons that we we need to test this out. We need to perhaps do some pilots um, to understand exactly when we're saying adequacy, what, what we need. And, and Mary, what do you think is adequate? Well, 
I think that people shouldn't be put into silos. Like, I think that, for example, with, um, with, uh, with access, or with any, with housing, I get that tell of you don't have enough income, or your, your income's a little too high, or you're disabled, or not disabled. I'm like, how about if you just treat me as human? Yeah. And I just address my needs. That's kind of what I think would make it adequate. Yeah, thank you. Well, this uh, this is a great question, seeing as we have some municipal candidates in in the room. So, um, so here here goes. Uh, and thank you for whoever whoever asked this, because you're reading our minds. Uh, what can be done to ensure basic income becomes a priority for Calgary City Council post the 2017 election? Anyone want to? Take a stab at that. Can I just, then, I'll mention something. We talked earlier about the low income sliding, the sliding scale. Um, and then we've also talked about the assistance card and all that stuff. But those programs wouldn't be needed if we had high enough income. Yes. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't be in the yeah. deficit. Anyone else want to take a shot at that? I'll take a shot. So, one of the challenges with a city election, a municipal election, is a lot of these conversations do not fall under the purview of the municipality. And as a result, they do not have enforceable rules within this. So we can talk all we want at a municipal level. Uh, the question that I would ask back is, what are you doing to start that conversation with the municipal leaders or those who seek to be leaders and what is their plan on asking those difficult questions when it comes to transfer payments, the money that comes to the increasing urbanization of the two big cities in, in Alberta, the deficit in infrastructure despite more people every day moving and expecting services out of really remote places or very high places. So I think as leaders and as community members, when you are running municipally, you need to be able to focus your questions and your intent on the areas where you have control. And that is using the voice of Calgarians to impress upon those people holding the purse strings to actually affect change. Um, I just wanted to add that I think we as communities need to be resilient, need to be strong, um, unified, and I think those voices need to be heard. We need to be bold, and sometimes you need to ask for the dream. So the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands is doing a basic income experiment, and soon there will be experiments in Lindsay, Ontario, Thunder Bay, and, um, and Hamilton. So a city stepping up, a great city like Calgary stepping up and being a part of a of an income experiment is actually t totally uh, uh, a feasible strategy to lead the way. Um, the other would be to um, change the discourse altogether around why why are we sad about the low income transit pass gobbling up all of our money when it's a fantastic transportation um, ecologically and also to get people moving. These are things that, it's the discourse of investing in people, the discourse of the greatest city, the discourse of the um, city that is celebrating its diversity, that um, it's not leaving people behind. That's a positive discourse that the municipality can bring after the next election that will actually hopefully um, stimulate you know, these types of bold social experiments uh, from those who do have the power to implement them. Thank you. And, um, Calgary doesn't have an ask of all of you. So, and uh, Yvonne and Brian will come up later to, to make that ask. So, uh, Dr. McIntyre, so this is, um, this is your set of questions. Um, how can we get a copy of your slide presentation? <laughs> <laughs> so I've been taped, enough, so you'll be having a YouTube type thing, I guess. Um, and what else? And then the slides are there, and yeah, can we, can we send those slides up? I'll I'll uh, I'll PDF. Okay, all right. You're she's being very generous. Thank you so much. Well, it's all published. It's all yours. <laughs> all right. Next question is for you. So, at a recent poverty conference I attended, um, 
uh, in the spring, it was discussed that there is uh, $31 billion of food waste in Canada per year. Uh, what can we do to fix it? Well, I'm not sure the person was in the room when I talked about this concept of conflation. Lots of problems and so little time to solve them all. So food waste is a problem, and it's a problem of packaging, it's a problem of um, expiry date, um, it's a problem of, um, of um, portion size and, um, and hospitals and, and other institutional things. But it's not a problem that's going to be solved by letting the hungry eat it. And so um, I've met with uh, Brian Pincott even in this um, in this city to ask for the um, Zero Waste Council to take its seven top principles of why food waste is a problem and to take up number eight, which is that, and we can also feed hungry people. People do not need food, they need income. And so this is absolutely not a solution. Again, food security says we need to reduce food waste. We need to have a global food system that's fair and just and sustainable. We need sovereignty. That is not the same as people um, not being food insecure. That is a poverty income problem. Okay. All right, I'm going to keep going uh, with you, Lynn. Uh, in the research you've done, what is the yearly cost to um, Canadian society of household food insecurity? So thanks for that. We have not been able to do the burden of disease, um, and so it's a, it's a huge, huge challenge, and uh, we would welcome other researchers to do that. Um, we would suggest, however, when you see burden of disease studies such as mental health, depression, um, even arthritis, when you consider the, um, the chronic disease burden that comes across the span and others, that I think we're equaling most of the big ticket items like diabetes and others. Um, but it is an important study that needs to be done, and, and our, our study um, uh, concepts suggested we would do a burden of disease um, study when we first got our funding over five years ago, and it became you know, just too unwieldy to do. But I think we're talking again, um, it, it's of a, a scale of, uh, of diabetes, in terms of uh, comparable and important condition. Okay. All right, um, we'll just stay with you, Liz. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do we encourage much healthier food options? Um, and the person gave, you know, no mac and cheese. Um, how do we encourage bacon diets? Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, you see my biases coming out. Um, uh, religious based meat food. Um, um, and comments, especially at food banks. So I'm not. Do you want to take a stab at that? So I'm going to let James talk about this because the one thing I wanted just to emphasize again is that food insecurity is not about having no food skills, not or not a budget, not knowing what is nutritious food. Um, I have lots of studies that show um, the opposite. Um, the one thing I ever asked of James was when I was looking at chronic kidney disease. This is an impoverishing condition, leading ultimately for many to dialysis, which is one of the most expensive things we can do to our healthcare system. And he didn't have a renal hamper. And he, he's got a diabetic hamper, and you know, for all the conditions that come through. And I, I did ask for a renal hamper for the, the impoverishment of that condition. And fortunately, the Kidney Disease um, Society of Canada is looking at the impoverishment of that, um, of that condition on its members. So I let him speak about the food bank giving um, quality food. But the better, a better food bank and building a better food bank and better healthy food in the food bank and better, that is not an answer for food insecurity. Um, that is just for better hampers. So maybe we can just talk about that. So using the example of renal hamper, it took us, I think it was six months of research multiple agencies going through top to bottom, side to side, we have the first renal hamper in North America. It was actually kind of a no-brainer because for more than a decade we've been doing celiac hampers. We can sort for kosher. We've been dealing with uh, different cultural, ethnic, preference-based foods for an extremely long time. Um, one of the things that separates the Calgary Food Bank and other food banks in Canada are looking at this is that when we look at it as a quality indicator, we say, so our, our 
target is to meet or exceed Canada's food guide. Now I'm going to ask you, do you how many people in this room eat Canada's food guide or better? Okay, I've seen about maybe 10 hands. So holding people to standards where we've set that standard and attained it when we look at food and how food moves through our system, we get held again to what is quality food. So I'm, I'm on tweet as record as it were because I got questioned about indigenous food. And I said, well, last I checked, it's really difficult to hunt caribou and pick berries in downtown Calgary. So from that, I'll give you the fact that my master's is on traditional Aboriginal culture and societal defense and how we adapt to what we think somebody else wants rather than asking the question, what would you like? Exactly. Yeah. I would like craft dinner because it's comfortable. There's actually been a study by Dr. Rock that said, you know what, in a time of crisis, I love a good macaroni and cheese because the fats are satiating. <coughs> Right now there's a conversation about eating more fats in your diet because we're not getting enough fat and the potential is that it may actually have a changing effect on our, our metabolism. So when we look at food banks and food quality, the food that's being donated is only one part of the equation. The engagement of organizations and people to that food quality to actually learn what's in their community when you go to the Women's Center and you see that, oh, this is the type of food that is here, this is what we've got, have you ever asked if you can get something different? My note today for Mary, to find out that there's a cabinet in her building that has food that only certain people are able to access that food, I'm going, oh, that's a phone call we can change tomorrow morning. These are the things when we're asking about quality food. Waste at a food bank, 5%. You want to come dumpster dive, have at it because there's not much left in there given the fact that about 40% of our food, and we're seeing this increase in food banks and food programs, is coming from a fresh variety because there's an increased demand from the public for more locally grown, fresh foods that have different nutrient content than what you would get in a ceramic package. Each one has its value. I'm not gonna start eating vegan, but man, I do love a caribou steak. Thank you. So, you know, one of the things, um, <laughs> um, so for those of you who know me know that I uh, work very closely with Poverty Talks, which is uh, an advocacy group of people who experience poverty every day and, and have had to access some of these services that at times it hasn't been a very dignified service. And uh, there's a saying that, uh, you know, dignity is the first casualty of poverty. And so one of the questions I have here is, how could the food bank model orientate itself to be more dignified for its users? Define dignified. So we've asked, for lack of a better word, everybody to define dignity for a food bank. And, and we've asked people leaving the building, we've asked people six months after they came to the food bank and we never saw them again. And what we continuously hear from people who have come to the food bank is, when I walked in the door, I felt better because you did not strip me of my dignity. In fact, you added to my dignity. So it's interesting that from one side, individuals who have never had that learned experience will say it's not dignified but when you talk to the people who you are able to connect to other community services that you can say to them it's okay we've got the food part we know that's not the issue because something else is broken down as has been commented today on the root causes that are complex we have so many people who have come back to us and said you did right by me there are things that can be improved, surely, great. How do we improve them? Do you want you know, more fish? Do you want different kinds of vegetables and fruit? We need that information. But the overwhelming majority of people that we go back and talk to say, when we walked in your door, the volunteers and the people that we met gave us wings. We weren't treated badly. So when there are worries about, you know what, we weren't treated dignified, I would love to know 
my phone line's on the website, phone me and tell me how. Because we can't find people who will come forward and say, you messed with me. And if we have, I'm sorry, you need to say something so that we can actually identify it, not throw rocks from the other side of the wall. Because right now you're hitting a lot of people who don't hold that same opinion. Thank you. So, um, oh, uh, yeah, just wanted to add a quick thing. I, I, I know the, the fantastic work at the food bank will be very closely, but again, um, it's not about the food bank. What's great for dignity, uh, people being able to have their own money without having to prove yes. themselves over and over again. that money has they choose to use it and again we're talking about choices and I totally agree with you Mary we all have different things we like think about our own experiences right when we go to the supermarket you choose what you like to eat um, so that that's what will really bring back dignity and trust as well we need to trust as well people we have a very uh, particular framing of, of uh, food insecurity of being poor experiencing poverty um, people can be trusted with their own money, and that's really important. So, we talked a little bit earlier about the low income transit pass, and we've talked earlier about the city of Calgary accessing services and saying, look, if you sign up for this program, there's a whole bunch of things that we will make you aware of that you can get, and you can access, and you can bring into your family that you may not have otherwise had. You fill in one form, Everything goes through that and we're all good. So what we quietly did at the food bank is we asked that question. Did you fill in the fair spare form? Yeah, great. When do you want to pick up your food? What agency would you like to connect with in order to get that food? How can we help you? But the resistance that we got from the city, this, we were told by the city that we were not allowed to do that because that was their measure. And we weren't allowed to use it just as a, you know what, we don't want to see any paperwork. You just, did you qualify? Yeah, great, let's go, here's the food. How do we connect? So there are barriers, there are systemic barriers to people who are trying to maintain their well-being off the damage of others. So I think we have to break those and say, you know what, what is dignified? Let's go and do this. If it, and if it means that we do this or rather than that, then let's go and do that. Rather than saying we need to stop. No, thanks, James. I, I, it's a difficult question to, to answer, and I, I appreciate your openness and, and Carol, uh, your perspective. Can I say something? Sure. So this is a follow up. I live in the community of Inglewood, which is which I really like. It's a beautiful community. It has some cool little shops and grocery store and uh, restaurants. But it does not have an affordable grocery store. So I'd like to see that there is at least one affordable grocery store in every community in the city. So this is our last question. And uh, so, so again, it, it's a theme around the, the idea of dignity. And, um, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of power dynamics that happen between uh, folks who are accessing a service uh, and those who are providing it. And so, what will, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take license with this, this question and, and think about if we tie basic income into this, this equation, how, how do we empower people um, to get what they need and what they decide? Um, and um, how do we shift? this idea of lack of dignity through basic income. Can I say one thing that the action always says? You get proud by practicing. <laughs> you gotta practice and keep on practicing and sharing your voice until you get heard. And things are done. Anyone else want to take it? I'm stealing some of perhaps Dr. McIntyre's stuff, but the, the proof, I can't remember the, the, the actual name, but um, University of Toronto has this a group called Proof, they look at some of the things, and what their research is showing is that 
individuals making decisions on what kind of food they buy, individuals making decisions on how they use their money, individuals making decisions on what food they prepare and how they deal with their family are as good, if not better, than the general population. So when we look at a basic income, I think part of this discussion will be, if you have the means in which to participate fully in society, you don't have to set up special programs. You will walk down to your corner store, you will buy what you need, and you will make a fabulous meal out of that. That's how we get rid of programs where people look and go, well, that's not correct. You're right. But what are we going to do about it in the meantime? So if we bring that bar up in form of dignity, there is a power struggle, but if I use the food bank fully informally, my, my, I think the stated goal of the food bank is that we're going to write a book on how you close a food bank, and then we're going to go do a book tour in the 10 degrees above and below the equator on the planet Earth. Because I've lived in the Arctic, I don't want to go back there. So we're all going to go live around the equator. And we're going to tell everybody how we close the food bank by engaging the community on doing what's right. By engaging the people by saying you are an active participant in your community. And I believe that all, a lot of the other problems will just start to solve themselves and disappear. Supply and demand. Who's coming on the tour? <laughs> um, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the, um, the fact that it's individual. I think there's a huge opportunity, I'm thinking about women and um, gender division of labor, um, gender roles, uh, family composition. I think there's, um, with this idea of an of individual basic income, allowing women to have an autonomous income, um, there's great, a great opportunity for dignity, of course, but also empowerment of women. So that's, that's really a key um, piece to, uh, to basic income. So I just wanted to remind us that if we were able to provide a basic income, two million of the four million people that are food insecure would disappear and they would go on in their daily lives and be intermingling with you. They wouldn't need to be empowered, they wouldn't need capacity to be built, we wouldn't need them to be getting you know, special courses on whatever. They would be part of the great us, the mythical sort of middle class. Um, so it's this is not a stratification of the poor, the food insecure. These are structures that are arbitrary and they're not, those are not real structures. And they are, again, um, they disappear with the people that move out of them. So the town of Dauphin was a town without poverty while the mid-com experiment was going on between 1976 and 79, um, 74 and 79. So we could have a town of Calgary without poverty. And it wouldn't be that anybody you know, was special. They needed to be empowered up. That's the way life goes on when you're not being trod down by the STEM system and the structures that are what um, poverty actually uh, creates and that creates poverty as well. Thank you. So uh, we'll give the last word to Mary. When you make something accessible to one group of people, you make it accessible to everyone. So for example, what's the point of building a grocery store that's affordable if no one can get in because there's stairs in front of it? And what's the point of having a grocery store when your ride, for example, Access Calgary, doesn't allow you to carry more than two bags of groceries home each trip? All right. Well, I've got, there are a lot more questions here, so thank you so much. Uh, if you have more questions, we'll collect them, uh, we'll be looking through them, I promise. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming up here. I know it's, it's, it's not an easy place to be up here, and so thank you so much for, for having the courage to be here, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we, have, we have gifts for everyone. Uh, you get a book. And you get a book, and you get a book. And uh, so in case uh, you're so inspired, uh, this is a really great book that uh, Brian, our co-chair, has been reading and has in his back pocket. It's called Utopia for Realists by Redrick F. Bregman, I believe his name is. 
And um, so we wanted to give our, our panelists just a, a small token of our appreciation. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Lee. Brian and I co-chair co the Basic Income Calgary Action Group, which is an action group of Basic Income Canada Network. So we um, we work together um, at the municipal and the provincial and the federal level. Oh, Brian is with Engineers Without Borders, and I'm from Social Workers for Social Justice. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you all for coming out tonight. This is great. Uh, thanks to our keynote speaker, panelists, Daryl, for trying to shepherd uh, them through the panelists. Um, and thanks to BCC for enabling this to happen tonight uh, and uh, being able to share some of the uh, ideas and benefits that a basic income could provide. Food insecurity and health benefits are two of many, many benefits that could be obtained by having a basic income. Uh, other things are like uh, social justice, or uh, criminal justice, those kind of costs would go down, additional jobs, protection against precarious employment. There are a number of things that we'll be exploring uh, further as we, as we go forward. Um, so we wanted to emphasize the takeaway uh, piece of paper, which basically has a, a summary and very nice pictorials of our principles. Thanks to Kat for all of that. It's fantastic. And what you can do to help. Broken down between learning, learning about basic income and, and its benefits, about acting, which is what we're all hopefully going to move towards, and uh, sharing. Uh, in, uh, around learning, um, uh, Yvonne mentioned the Basic Income Canada Network. There are many uh, networks throughout the municipalities in uh, Canada, and the Basic Income Canada Network kind of tries to tie those together and give us uh, some strategy and some information. Um, there's, uh, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, we have uh, network meetings every quarter. This is actually one of the network meetings, uh, a little broader because of uh, ECC's input. But we'll be trying to get as many people as we can through our network to explore the inf uh, where we're at, implore, uh, talk about actions, what we can do, and also learn more about basic income. In November, we'll be talking about jobs and precarious employment and job insecurity and what basic income might uh, be able to do about that. Um, let me see. Oh, Basic Income Canada has a, a pretty good website. There's lots of information there. There's links to other websites. So if you want to learn more, um, you can go there and there, there's some really good information there. I think that's it. Well, what we want you all to do, um, Brian and I have talked as you learn more about basic income, as you join with us in this important work. Um, the question was asked earlier about how can the municipal government be involved in basic income. We work at all three levels. Municipalities take the brunt of poverty, um, and uh, a national strategy is to have municipal councils pass um, resolutions to support basic income and encourage their province the Alberta government in this case, to support, design, and implement a basic income in cooperation with the national level. So it's complex and we work on all three levels. The municipal election gives us the opportunity to go to forums and ask candidates um, what they think about basic income and if they would support such a city council resolution. There's a, a number of forums coming up. Engineers Without Borders, for example, is sponsoring one on September 19th that will include um, the issue of basic income. Um, you can go to democracy.ca, I think. Does, that, democracy Calgary. Does democracy Calgary. Calgary. Right. Democracy. Calgary. Democracy. Thank you. Um, 
We want you to write your MLA, advocating for a principles-based basic income program in Alberta. And um, talk to your friends, talk to your families. Um, let's build this movement and let's get this done. It isn't a dream, it's possible. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you to our lovely panelists, and thank you again, Dr. McIntyre. It was a great evening. I'm going to remind you all to fill out that evaluation form. I'm also going to remind you to take some food with you. And finally, if you need a transit ticket, you can come see Daryl. She has some available. And I think that's everything. Thanks again, everyone. Have a fabulous evening. Get home safe. So the definition of food insecurity is lack of access to adequate food because of financial constraint. So the definition is based on people answering questions around worried about running out of food, compromising the quality of food in their diet and going out without food for an entire day sometimes. These people are having a great deal of material deprivation and we've been able to show that income in fact reduces food insecurity far more effectively than any food because they are able to um, meet their basic needs beyond food, such as housing, transportation, but also they get the kind of food that they would like. So the, um, the state of being food insecure is a state of income insecurity, and therefore people need income, not food, when they're food insecure. I'm thinking, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, um, uh, we work with uh, women and families, um, and the first thing that they tell us constantly is uh, dignity, like how um, food insecurity impacts their dignity and their ability to choose for themselves. Um, so I think that would be a major step, having basic income, uh, in terms of having uh, that dignity back, and the second thing I'm thinking of in terms of um, uh, all the work that we do around gender roles and uh, lack of access uh, to employment for women, um, I think it would be a, there would be a great empowerment piece. Um, women being able to have an income, whatever their choice is in their lives, um, and not being able to be not being dependent on um, uh, familial situation, family composition. Um, gender roles, and also uh, when we think about basic income, so unconditional money um, that women could have access to, it could be a way as well of, of course, being more food secure for them and their families, but also of um, um, having access to uh, skills building, education, all those pieces together, right? It's much more than uh, having money, having income, it's really the ability of leading um, fulfilling lives. The basic income program would improve my life. I'd be able to uh, eat what I want to eat, live where I want to live, and go to school where I want to go to the school. A basic income would affect many people and the organizations that work with them because it would provide a substantial floor from which no one would fall and there would be no holes through which a safety net would be inadequate. So my interest in basic income is a place, of a country where we all have dignity, where we don't have to prove our poverty, and when you're not hanging on to your last single pill medication because you can't afford to get any more. And people can afford to go to the doctor. And I think of a lot of people I work with who are, have significant disabilities and are facing many barriers to access, and it's one less hurdle for many people to be citizens in our country. Basic income would be very important because, number one, food insecurity. As we've been talking about tonight, people can afford food, they can afford to eat, they can afford to feed their family, they can become healthier at work, they're going to be more productive employees, they're going to be more productive students. We've seen that there is a link between hunger and childhood success in education and school and higher grades if people are fed properly, but also puts a roof over people's feet. Uh, head. It 
can virtually end homelessness if that person genuinely, want, genuinely wants to be off the streets. But we also have to keep in mind the definition of basic income and how much that is, what is considered a livable income. Uh, those are a lot of conversations that people aren't talking about. The cost of living in various parts of Canada are very high. In Calgary, rents really have not gone down with the, uh, with the vacancy rates going up. And I think we actually need a fairly higher basic income than people would be proposing. I'm thinking almost $38,000 is what's needed to actually be able to live a life of dignity every year. And we can end homelessness with it, we can end childhood hunger with it, we can end hunger period with it, we can improve the economy through increased, not only increased spending, but increased productivity among our workforce. Basic income is essentially almost a magic pill. I'm not gonna say it's gonna solve everything, but it can solve almost all of the problems facing a good chunk of Albertans today.